It is my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce to you Mr. Patrick Ramming. As we said in the little blurb on the website, simply put, Pat is an architect, poet, singer, songwriter with ideas for improvement, and he does them all very well. Now a little bit about him. Patrick Ramming is an architect with Pat Ramming and Associates, and they're a design firm led by an artist for over 40 years, affectionately known as Pat Ramming. And he has developed his unique approach to the build of a built environment, an approach that result in what re results in what he calls enhanced living environments. Architectural space is experienced as a whole and must therefore be created by an integrated process. Enhanced living environments benefit from an integrated creative approach to climate, culture, and history while celebrating developments in technology. So Pat Ramming and Associ Associates seeks to discover and expose those unique opportunities inherent in each project. And what more than what he's here to talk to us about tonight to, to display those qualities, a downtown in transition, rebuilding the family business. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Pat Ramming. Thank you, Rick. Um, the check is in the mail. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Warning. Warning. The Surgeon General warns that thinking is an extreme sport that should not be engaged in without proper preparation. Symptoms of unprepared thinking are apathy, confusion, and that nagging feeling that you are a victim. If you find that you've been thinking and may not be properly prepared, you should immediately seek professional help. If the symptoms persist, find the nearest eight-year-old and ask him or her to play a video game with you until your symptoms are gone. The title of my talk is A Downtown in Transition, Rebuilding the Family Business. Over the next while, we'll ask ourselves why after two decades and several million dollars, there is so little evidence of the so-called revitalization of the downtown and what we ought to do to improve the situation. I do not claim to be an expert. So I am indeed asking you to participate in an extreme sport and to share some thinking with me. Officers and members of the Nassau Institute, friends, good evening. What is a downtown? For most people, it's just the place where you go to shop. As a result, it's not unusual to hear people say that downtown Nassau was killed by Palmdale or the mall. Not only is this not true, it is an opinion that is partly responsible for the fact that we've been unable to revive it. You see, a downtown is much more than a place to shop. In fact, you don't uh, shop downtown. Sorry. In fact, it is not downtown because you shop there. You shop there because it is downtown. The reason the people of the city of Nassau no longer shop downtown is because it is no longer their downtown. When I started preparing this talk, I knew I would be discussing the relationship between the downtown and the city of Nassau. I assumed that most people would agree to some extent with my description of the boundaries of the city. Then I spoke to a few friends two of whom were former legislators, and was surprised by the passion with which they accepted the definition 
established in law. The statutory limits of the city are pretty much the same as the limits of the downtown. And for anyone who accepts that definition, my whole talk would make no sense. So before we discuss what a downtown is, we should have an agreement, if only for this evening, on what a city is. There are many definitions of, the, of a city, but they all share one common thread. A city is a large town. That means it is a place defined by the presence of significant numbers of people. And while there have always been people living in the downtown area, they have never been a significant part of the people on the streets and in the shops and making the downtown exciting and interesting. The people of the city, by and large, have always lived over the hill. Their invisibility may be understandable under a foreign administration. But for me, there's no reason to maintain that fallacy after even internal self-government, let alone independence. But that is what we appear to have done. What is important here is that the city of Nassau exists outside the downtown and is the real reason the downtown existed in the first place. So when I talk about the city, I'm not talking about just the downtown area. I'm talking about a core area defined by the sea to the north, Collins Wall on the east, Wolf Road on the south, and Nassau Street on the west. Outside those borders, creating suburbs but very much part of the city are such places as Sears Edition, Palmdale, The Grove, and Chippingham. This is the network of neighborhoods for whom the area we call downtown was once a vital organ. So again, what is a downtown? Well, let's start with the most fundamental definition. The downtown is a functioning part of a city that satisfies five critical needs for the people of the city. First, it is indeed a center of trade and commerce. One of the terms used for the downtown is central business district. It is the commercial core of the city. Secondly, it is a place where the history of the city is celebrated in the built environment, usually in monuments and symbols. Thirdly, it is where the accomplishments of the people of the city are on show, both in the built environment with statues and the like, and in the rhetoric of the city as it eulogizes its, his its heroes in street names, parks, and buildings. Fourthly, it celebrates the personality of the people of the city in cultural activity by providing opportunities for cultural activity, cultural expression in all its forms. And finally, it should provide the city with its sense of environmental, political, and social order by the handling of the city's federal display. All cities must live up to these responsibilities. And not too long ago, downtown Nassau lived up to most of them. You see, 50 years ago, the world of the Bahamas passed through downtown Nassau. It was as though downtown Nassau was the downtown for the whole country. Every sloop and every mailboat arrived at New Providence through the downtown bringing people, produce, fish, count, animals, and taking back supplies, tools, and people. And contrary to the irresponsible rhetoric of last month, all of the people of the city of Nassau filled the streets uh, of Bay Street on bicycles, drays, carts, and trucks, most of them 
on foot, fishing supplies from the ironmongery, school supplies from the stop and shop, dress patterns, buttons and thread from the Melitas, Christmas cards and toys from City Pharmacy. The market range was not only the place to meet family from the out island, it was a place to buy and sell fresh fish, conch, meats, and produce. It was a place the people of the city went when they wanted to be taken seriously. It was where the Burma Road riot went. It was where you went to rush or watch Junkanoo. The people of the city of Nassau followed Market Street to Market and the businesses of the downtown thrived. It was certainly their central business district. Then it provided them with historical record. Much of the history of the city was presented in architecture, federal, uh, federal ecclesiastical, and military. As a colony, the history of the British was the most in evidence, but it represented the city at that time. Historic cathedrals marked its edges with St. Francis in the west and St. Matthew's in the east. Christ Church Cathedral defined the city as city. And then there were other uh, cathedrals. The Presbyterian Cathedral, St. Andrew's Kirk. The Methodist Cathedral, Trinity. And the Baptist Cathedral, Zion Baptist. Historic hotels included British Colonial and the Royal Victoria. Residences like Jacaranda, Cascadilla, Curry House, and Mount Fitzwilliam, home of the Governor General, carried the history of Bahamian architecture into the 20th century. The wonderfully historic complex of federal buildings around the Library Green anchored the downtown historical display. That same Library Green celebrated Bahamians who fought in two world wars, sharing the accomplishments of the city's people. The sculpture of Don Silo, the turtle shell artistry of Johnson Brothers, divers who could spot a coin underwater from a 50-foot dive told the world that Bahamians were indeed an exceptional people. We celebrated Sidney Poitier's Academy Award in what we agreed at the time was the most important spot in the city, Rawson Square. The special personality of the people of Nassau filled the downtown. Shops displayed ceramic chick chanis and decorated plates from Chelsea pottery, intricate straw work uh, decked the sidewalks of Bay Street, Art galleries and dozens of nightclubs showed off the music, dance, and exotic culture of the city. Parades by the Boys Brigades, the Boy Scouts, the Jumper Church passed through the downtown to celebrate a culture of discipline. And finally, the presence of the center of government, the highest courts in the land, and the central police station reinforced the city's sense of order. This was Nassau's downtown. Like moths to a flame, the people were attracted to the downtown and made the downtown part of their planning. They placed their schools at the edge of downtown, Boy Central, which later became Western Senior and Junior, Government High School, St. John's College, or in the city, Queen's College and St. Andrews. They located the hospital, the insane asylum, police compound, and the graveyards as near to the downtown as possible. Today, there is no relationship at all between the downtown area and the people of the city of Nassau. 
It no longer provides the city with a center of commerce or respect for its history, celebrate its accomplishments, or present its culture. What is left of its federal display is threatened by an extreme lack of interest. And the sense of order is the victim of neglect. In short, as I pointed out earlier, this is no longer Nassau's downtown. In recent years though, governments have spent millions of dollars on expensive reports promising that by returning the romance to the downtown or by bringing people back to the downtown to live, the area might be resuscitated. As you can tell, I have bad news for you. It is certainly possible to address these shortcomings in the existing downtown, but it would take major surgery and the patient would be changed completely. For the area to become the city's downtown again is not a matter of cosmetics or of population. It is an organic matter. The downtown would once again have to serve the city in ways it is most likely not prepared to do. On the other hand, the area excels in its role as tourism product. It is still a fine example of a British colonial town. Its quaint architecture, narrow streets, handsome black policemen dressed in starched white tunics with polished brass buttons, and its colorful ceremonies in white wigs and multicolored costumes that still create a viable branding for a Caribbean tourist destination. So to restate the obvious, the present downtown is no longer downtown, as it does not serve a city. We should stop referring to it as downtown. Yes, that leaves the city without a downtown, an urgent issue for any serious government. But more importantly to this discussion, it means there's a need to confirm the present downtown's true identity as primary product in our tourism business. I should point out that this is not unusual. Just about every city built before the turn of the 20th century has found itself in this position. The original city center no longer supports the commercial and cultural needs of their populace but has developed value as an historic zone, often used for tourism. And those for whom their history made tourism attractive have most often, often chosen to build a new downtown elsewhere. New Orleans, San Juan, Havana, Mexico City, Montreal. But the key to the success of those his historic zones is a vision based upon an understanding of the mechanics of the tourism business. So for the rest of this talk, let us assume that the area in question commits to its new identity as the major attraction called Old Nassau and to the development of a vision that supports its success. I've talked about the business of tourism as, as the family business and its importance to this effort. Let me tell you a little story. A group of students at a university were asked to share with the class examples of the ways wealth was created within their country's economy. The English student explained that in his town, iron ore was mined by a company in which many of the people of the town had shares as it was publicly traded and received dividends as the ore was sold to the steel mills in the area. Much of the infrastructure 
The business infrastructure was therefore designed to encourage increases in the amount of ore mined as well as the price at which it could be sold. Many of the, of the citizens had become wealthy, including his family. The Chinese student pointed out that his country traded in manufactured goods with the state as the primary partner, so that semi-private manufacturers benefit, benefit from the state's global reach, as well as their control of labor costs. Many Chinese businessmen had gotten wealthy within that system. Finally, the Bahamian student rose proudly to say that his country was the number one tourist destination in the Caribbean. Wealth, he said, was created as the large numbers of visitors came and went. Then he sat down. The teacher asked him, I suppose the money spent by the visitors is what creates the local wealth? Yes. Well, no, said the student, rising again uncomfortably. Actually, the money is spent at hotels belonging to uh, hotel companies who are mostly foreign. And the airlines and the cruise ships are also foreign owned. I guess the real benefit of the activity is the jobs created. But, says the teacher, we have seen in our studies that it is extremely rare for an employee to become wealthy. So how does your tourist destination create wealth through employment? The Bahamian student's voice broke as he said, I don't know, and sat down again. 65 cents out of every dollar we spend to build schools or roads come from the business of tourism. A business, I suggest, we have not been overly concerned about. Let me share some shocking reasons we should be concerned about the family business. Did you know, first of all, that between 2005 and 2012, we lost almost 30% of our business? From almost 1.9 million stopover visitors in 2005 to 1.35 million in 2012. Almost a 30% loss in business. It's the recession, you say. Okay. Then what about the decade of the 90s, before the so-called recession? Stopover visitors to the Bahamas rose a paltry 11.9%, while crime-ridden Jamaicas rose 31.4%. The Dominican Republics rose 109%, and Cuba's rose 318%. By 2000, when we saw 1.59 million, more than 2012, by the way, Jamaica was just behind us at 1.3 million. The Dominican Republic was at 2.97 million. And Cuba had gone from 425,000 to over 1.7 million. By what kind of logic have we declared ourselves the leaders in tourism in the region. The reality is that our family business is in serious trouble and any conversation about the development of a significant product offering must center around the opportunity to rebuild the family business. Development of old Nassau must mean increasing its ability to attract more business and more importantly to make more money. But how do we approach rebuilding the family business using an historic zone? In other words, how does, a tour how does tourism really 
make money. Well, every profitable business makes money by providing a customer with a product for profit. In the business of tourism, wealth is created by the people who supply visitors in search of a place-specific experience. That, by the way, is the product in a tourist destination. With those experiences, or by those who make those experiences memorable. Whether they are tours, special retail experiences, events, resort experiences, or the many types of virtual experiences. These five categories of experiences are called attractions and are usually based on what I call the four pillars of tourism. Experiences of the local place, history, mythology, and lifestyle. That is our family business. And if we hope to again um, succeed in that business, we must relearn how that business works. Let me remind you, we inherited the business. When, the, when it operated under a different business model. But now the world has changed. And the business model has changed. And our business is failing. And if we hope to save it, we must learn how today's tourism business really works. If we listen to the local media and cultural activists, you would conclude that if you place vendors in the path of tourists, the vendors will make sales and the destination will succeed. And in some cases, those vendors will make lots of sales. But that is the tiniest part of the tourism business opportunity. It barely scratches the surface. Let me illustrate how an attraction works. I've chosen an American football game as the attraction to discuss. The business planning begins with the need for the game to attract an audience. So the teams are chosen with that in mind. The football game is the attraction. If the game is attractive, people pay to get in to watch it. The gate at a football game is a lot of money. That money may pay for the maintenance and upkeep of the stadium and the parking lots. Then, if the game is attractive enough, sponsors will pay for it to be broadcast. And while that may be a significant income, it is not the main way the football game makes money. You see, like the foreign hotels, very little of that money reaches the local community. Although in this case, it may pay the salaries and bonuses of the players <coughs> and the coaches. Now we can talk about the vendors, here representing the local business community. Imagine, if you will, 60,000 people trapped in a closed room. A PA system ensuring that they are screaming at the top of their voices for three hours. Imagine that the rivalry between the teams has been promoted so heavily that every one of the screaming fans simply must show support for their team. So for those three hours, three hours, or more, you have a captive audience for beer, hot dogs, pretzels, nachos, beer, sodas, flags, banners, beer, <laughs> and a wonderful variety of paraphernalia. Every screaming one of them begging to spend money at your concession. Can you imagine the sales volume? In fact, 
A ticket price of $30 becomes an afternoon of fun costing $100 or more. You do the math. That is how an attraction works. An experience is made available that creates an audience for a variety of products, the sale of which is an opportunity to create income. Similarly, a coffee shop next door to a theater in New York makes a killing. By the way, so do the ticket printers, the security company, the magazine publishers, the set designers, and a multitude of businesses that have no direct interest in the show itself. At an historical um, attraction, the need may be for historical or biographical books, refreshments, souvenirs, or postcards, to market a sound and light show or a dark ride that tells the story of the monument. The business of tourism is the business of the management of experiences. And the job of the tourist destination is to increase the stock of the experiences unique to itself. And to invent ways to help those having those experiences to enjoy spending their money. Let me repeat that. The job of the tourist destination is to provide an increasing stock of experiences unique to itself and to invent ways to help those having those experiences to enjoy spending their money. If you think that's greedy, then you should not be involved in my family business. But you should thank those who are, because they're responsible for two-thirds of the lifestyle you enjoy. Tourism is the largest business on the planet. It creates more wealth than any other business, and it's the business that drives the economies of the most successful cities in the world, from London to Paris to Rome to Tokyo to Las Vegas to Rio. So, how does this relate to old Nassau? It means that its number one commitment must be becoming a zone of successful attractions. What we agreed a few minutes ago that downtown Nassau should become old Nassau as soon as possible requires more than just a name change. We Bahamians have been experts at changing the name of failed programs. <laughs> What we need is to step back and ask ourselves what it takes to drive a successful experience business. The first thing it takes is effective leadership. To build a tourist destination requires an entrepreneurial mindset, a high tolerance for risk. This is critical. We think of Las Vegas as a place where a gangster went into the desert and bet much of his ill-gotten gains on a dream. Jean Drapeau bet his, his, his political future on bringing a World's Fair to Montreal and changed the fate of that city. A few moments ago I mentioned the relationship between the theater and the coffee shop in New York. The theater owner risks losing millions of dollars if his, shop, if his show flops, while the coffee shop owner has a low risk level as his product is not particularly expensive or volatile. Leadership by the theater owner is more likely to result in viable attractions 
than leadership by the coffee shop owner. It really is as simple as that. There is no more important requirement in the effort to develop a major destination than entrepreneurial leadership. The second requirement is a plan. The area has a personality. It has a history. It has existing elements that support the development of attractions. What it does not have is an attitude towards using those elements to create viable attractions. There is presently no incentive to develop attractions in the area. The destination sees the cost and hassle of creating an attraction as the developer's problem. If an attraction comes into existence, that's fine. If it doesn't, nothing is lost. Well, that is not true. The destination needs attraction. Sorry, the destination needs attraction more than it needs anything else. Attractions are the lifeblood of the destination. It needs to approach creating attractions with an attitude of absolute desperation if it's to avoid total demise. Keep in mind, that no money changes hands unless there are attractions. The more attractions there are, the more money changes hands. So there must be a plan to encourage the developers of attractions, whether by monetary incentives, re-engineered processes, public promotion, or the creation of the infrastructure needed to sustain success. There must be a plan to create more and more and more attractions. Thirdly, there is a need for education. First, most of the community has no idea what opportunities are available at an effective tourist destination. In an historic zone, those opportunities are multiplied. But unless the community understands the economic opportunities derived from creating a successful attraction, we will continue looking away from ourselves for the big developer, the foreign investor, who offers us only employment. Secondly, and perhaps the most important part of the education needed is the education of those people involved in the presentation uh, of the business. I once visited Egypt and found that tour guides are required to be highly educated. In New York or London, performers are the best in the business. They are highly trained professionals. If the story of the Bahamas is to be told, the tellers of that story, the actors, musicians, writers, and designers, must be professionals. They must be properly trained, and they must be properly paid. Sorry. Um, it is certainly not realistic to say that we are in the business of theater, that is, presenting ourselves for profit, and not have one single school for the performing arts in the country. <laughs> Preparation for the family business begins with a serious commitment to training and education. This is one of the most important investments we must make at this time. Competition is stiff. So, our job is to rescue a downtown interest transition and to rebuild the family business. We acknowledge that it's no longer a downtown, but we believe in its potential to become one of the most powerful destinations in the region. 
with a, mi a multitude of individual attractions offering experiences of our rich history, our strong belief systems, and our unique and exciting lifestyles. I hope we find the intestinal fortitude, the entrepreneurial leadership, and the commitment to professionalism to make that transition. Old Nassau is not the answer to our tourism business, but it is a start. It is the way I think we should think when we talk about, when we talk about development or re revitalization, whether in New Providence or Governor's Harbor. The business of tourism is the vehicle with which we have driven this country to great heights. And it offers even more opportunities. But we must discard our role as passengers and take the wheel. Whoops. Sorry. And take the wheel. Sorry about that. Anything less is simply a lack of responsibility for our country and the mismanagement of our family business. Thank you. Okay. I'm open to questions, yes. Would you say that the Bahamas has, has sufficient population to draw upon for all, all that is needed in the country? One of the main problems is that many of our young people go away to be educated and never come back. I don't know that I see that as a big problem. I've heard people talk about it a lot. The fact of the matter is that that happens to all countries. Um, you know, Americans go away and never come back. Um, one, at one time, there were more Guyanese outside Guyana than there were inside Guyana. Small town. The smaller the population, the bigger the opportunity. You know, we don't need to make as much as New York City for, for everybody to be doing well. The size is not an issue. It, it, what is an issue is that we have not figured out how to make our assets work for us. You know, when you, when you think about what we've done over the last 40 years or so, I'm going to say something else in a minute, but when you think about what we've done over the last 40 years or so, um, the biggest travesty is that we've approached tourism as though um, the Bahamas is one place and we can have one ad that goes out that says, come to the Bahamas. Well, that's the most ridiculous approach you can imagine. Every island in this country has a different personality, has different opportunities. You know, you could spend, you could spend years going around this country discovering this country. We're the ones who don't realize that. We're the reason the Ministry of Tourism advertises us as the Bahamas and that's it. The other side of that same thing, uh, a spin-off for that is this. In, I have a book coming out soon called uh, Tourist Money Never Done. And in that book, I, I point out that there are some rules of retail and you retailers in the place can tell me how far off I am. Uh, and the first two rules are very simple. Rule number one, if you have something to sell, make it easy to buy. Rule number two, if you are selling the same thing as your competitor, price drives your business. If you're selling something unique, price is not an issue. Fifty years ago, we had an advantage over our competition which was nearness to North America. But between the credit card, faster airplanes, and the internet, that advantage does not exist anymore. It has evaporated. So we are now in competition with everywhere 
between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. We can't hope to compete unless we're the cheapest. Now, I for one don't necessarily want to be the cheapest shop in the mall. So what, what does one do to not be the cheapest shop in the mall? What one does is one offers unique stuff. If a guy in New Jersey wanted to go uh, on a warm weather uh, vacation with his family, like I say, he's got more choice than you can shake a stick at. If he wanted to go to the spot where, West, where American civilization, contemporary American civilization began, by the way, most of you probably don't realize, but if you went to North America today and asked as an anthropologist, what is this society that you're watching? You would conclude it's the European in the Americas. And that would be true in North America, South America, Central America, and all over the Caribbean. And where did it begin? It began on a place called Guanahani in the Bahamas. We are the genesis of all contemporary civilization, American civilization. Now, if a guy wanted to take his kids to the spot where contemporary American civilization began, does he have any choice? It doesn't matter how much, he, how much we charge. The only place he can go is to Guanahani. That's what I mean when I say, you have to find out what you have that's unique. Yes, sir? You should be doing reenactments of the arrival of Cristobal Colón. Well, that's one of the things we could do, absolutely. But you know, that, the, the whole, what you're saying is that we have stories. Of course. We have millions of stories. In fact, once you understand what I'm saying, you go to any island in the Bahamas and there are dozens and dozens of stories. And there are five categories of attractions that you can use to share those stories for profit, right? Not everybody needs to be like they're in Nassau. People can live very wealthy lives on almost deserted islands if they have, if they recognize what stories they have to share and, and they're taught how to share those stories. There was a question, the one at the back. Pat, I want to make a comment mm -hmm. and then have a question. Mm -hmm. best friend and everything else, when he was 60, we did a trip in the Bahamas, which were an island hopping, of which, you know, one of our best operators here has, has down time. When my friends got finished with that six-day island hopping to Exuma, Long Island, and Catron, he said that it's the best vacation he has ever had in his life. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. No if, buts, or ends, and this is a man with no kids who's gone all over everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we have the product. Absolutely. We have an incredible product and I have to say I enjoyed the hell out of that trip myself, right? Mm -hmm. So we have it. And most people in the Bahamas don't even know that damn product exists. And shame on us for not getting more Bahamians to do that and, and letting them know the product exists. Because it does. All you have to do is go on, go on Bahamas.com, hit Island Hopping, and you'll see some of the most incredible vacations you could ever imagine in your life, anywhere from, you know, three, four days to two weeks. And it, and it is not that expensive. Anyway, that's my, my sell story to go along with what you've said. Okay. My question to you, and, and I know you and our great late brother who has passed along did an incredible study of what to do with the shore of Nassau. Mm -hmm. You know, from one end to the other, how do we fix this damn place? Yeah. Well, we I think have, we have an opportunity now that I've heard about. We have all of this blank space along the shore now, mm -hmm. and they want to build a boardwalk along the front. Well, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And, and I would really appreciate it because I know you've spent a lot of time studying this stuff, and that's why I'm here today to listen to you. You know, one of the things I, I want I wanted to do is I didn't want to give. I didn't want to give the uh, idea that, that there were solutions that were 
pat solutions, right? <laughs> forgive, forgive the pun. Um, the problem we have lived with for the last couple of decades is the problem of the good idea, right? Somebody comes up with a good idea and we launch out to implement the good idea. Five years later, that good idea is dead. We've wasted a bunch of money, etc. The problem is, it's not a question of what do we do to save or fix up the waterfront. It's a question of what is it that you'd like to do with this, this area? What would you like it to be? Once you decide what you'd like it to be, it'll tell you what you need to do to make it that, right? Different people will have different ways of expressing it. Now, I, I, um, it's hard to say it any other way, but it's, it's very difficult to say the thing to do at Charlotte Street is so and so, because there's 50 things that you could do at Charlotte Street. It's just a question of what you're headed towards. That's why I say you have to have a plan. The plan, though, is not a plan of what it looks like. It's not a plan of how many businesses you have. It's a, it's a plan that's organic. The way anything succeeds, you know, people use this term sustainable. There really is only one sustainable business, and that's a business that's making a profit. That's the only sustainable business. And so you have to approach what you're doing from the point of view that we are creating opportunities for businesses to make a profit. Now, I think there was a question here, Theo. What, in your view, is the major obstacle to this organic development? Because entrepreneurs have no problem stepping forward when they see an opportunity. And not being averse to risk or willing to put their money down mm -hmm. to create their dream. And if it fails, fair enough. Someone else sees another opportunity in that same spot mm -hmm. and succeeds. I, I, my question is related to that. Mm -hmm. is how relevant is race and politics to the formulation of this vision? I don't think race has any relevance whatsoever, but, I, but politics has tremendous relevance. The problem that, uh, that we have, Theo, is this. I mentioned that the number one requirement for creating um, a tourist destination is leadership that is entrepreneurial, not membership, but leadership. You can't have entrepreneurs trying to function in a bureaucratic, risk-averse environment. And so you have to have a change in leadership for that to happen. Yes? How are you, Mr. Colson? I think one uh, obstacle and opportunity mm -hmm. that exists in national that you wouldn't really focus on, since the shipping interests mm -hmm. have left the eastern end of Bay Street, that part of downtown Nassau continues to be derelict, abandoned, mm -hmm. an eyesore to everybody who passes it. Now, what is needed there? Well, a I combination of individual um, entrepreneurial activity plus an interest taken by the government who has to approve anything that's done. The government must step forward in a proactive way and encourage the development of area. That whole area could be the focus of the new projects, the new entrepreneurial projects, some cultural, some commercial, mm -hmm. that you were speaking of. The western end of Bay Street is quite congested already. The whole eastern end of Bay Street will provide a huge opportunity, which has not been focused on since the shipping interest left, and should be. I think it's been focused on. I think the problem is that you've got two very different um, groups of people that are focusing on it. Uh, one group of people uh, have a vision 
for it that is um, uh, what the realtors call highest and best use. The other group of people have a vision for it as an extension to the rest of downtown or rest of the area. Um, I think the problem that you have is that nobody's doing the work of creating a vision for the whole thing that would tell us what wants to happen uh, along that area. I don't think the question of congestion is at all relevant. You know, people keep talking about congestion as though moving the shipping was a red herring. It did not have to happen. It was not the reason that we were having a problem. I don't have a problem with them moving, but it wasn't the reason we were having a problem. Fort Lauderdale has the same thing. It's not, we just didn't have a vision for what we were doing in the air, and we still don't. And so that part of my reason for deciding to take this on was to see if I could help um, create a movement towards a vision for that area. And I've thrown out what I think is a viable vision or a beginning of a vision for the area and we'll see what happens after that. Yes, you Rick. Sorry, I just wanted to ask, you mentioned organic tourism or, or ideas. Mm -hmm. the, the John Watling's uh, tour, yeah. tour, the young uh, Miss Alana Rogers, there's a young man, Jamie, can't think of his last name, just doing what I understand is a fantastic job of organizing things, talking about a bit of a history. Mm -hmm. um, do you see much more of that developing? or Absolutely. I mean, again, just scratches the surface though. I mean, you know, we have, I'm gonna throw a number at you just to make a point. What you're saying is that we have 10 attractions. We need a thousand. That's, that's where we are, you know. Um, take any, Orlando has never had to give a hotel an incentive to open. They created a whole bunch of people looking for some place to live, and a bunch of hotel companies came in and said, can you find me a spot? Not only do we give the hotels incentives, we then pay people to go live in the hotels. And the only reason is that we haven't focused on providing a reason for them to come in the first place. 49 years ago, Fort Charlotte had a sound and light show, and a legitimate museum in its basement. Today, it's got some storyboards. I mean, that's not backward. That's, I mean, that's insane. A few years ago, I was talking to somebody about the possibility of leasing the fort and creating a, a show that would have, that would use holograms to tell the story of the pirates. That was too futuristic, I guess. Well, a month and a half ago, I sat and I watched a tribute to Michael, Michael Jackson, where Michael Jackson danced on stage with the dancers, and it was a hologram. It wasn't a look-alike, it was Michael Jackson, right? That is the level of technology that your competition is using, and you're, you're putting up storyboards. You're just not in the same business. That is why we have lost 30% of our business in seven years. When, in 1991, when the Dominican Republic decided they would build the largest monument to, to Christopher Columbus in the rest of the world, right? We were rowing about whether Christopher Columbus was a nice fellow or not. <laughs> in 91, they had 1.7 million visitors. In 2000, they had 2.97 million visitors. We could continue to argue about whether Christopher Columbus is nice or not. We've got a warehouse full of product and we've put the lock on it and put another lock on top of that lock 
to make sure that nobody ever pulls that product out. I, I sometimes use an analogy to explain what it is we're doing. We have a shop. The shop is called the Bahamas. That shop sells experiences. Experiences are the things that are supposed to be on our shelf. The Ministry of Tourism goes out and they find us, they do an excellent job of finding customers. They bring the customers to our front door. The door opens and they walk in and there's nothing on the shelf. How can we make money? We can't. That's what we're doing. And we're not talking about some side business. We're talking about the business that generates two-thirds of our national income. I find it, I find it almost criminal that for the last two years we've been discussing how we tax ourselves. But we haven't been discussing how we make money. It doesn't matter how you tax yourself if you're not making any money. So, <laughs> thank you. That's it? One more question. Yes, sir. In your opinion, what happened to the nightclubs? Um, you know, like actually, no, that's a good question. It's a good question, and, and, and I'm going to give you a long answer. I had a short answer before I did an article recently, and I think the short answer um, is mis misleading. First, I'll tell you what happened downtown. Why downtown died, so I could put that to rest. As I mentioned, downtown was downtown for the city. Everybody went downtown. Uh, they shopped downtown. They were entertained downtown, etc. And then, the heart of downtown, the market, was moved to Potter's Key. Boom! Heart gone. So all those businesses that depended on the flow of people down to the market died. Stop and shop, Melitas, City Pharmacy, all gone. Once they left, because that included the convenience stores, the people who lived downtown, who previously could do everything they wanted to do within walking distance of where they lived, now had to find a way to get to the food store somewhere over the hill. So now they had to have a car in a place where they had no place to park. So what did they do? They moved to Oaks Field. The nightclubs in between cruise ships, the way the nightclubs made a living was that the people who lived downtown would stop in in the evening and have a cocktail before going home. Any evening you could go to, um, what was the name of the club that was on Charlotte Street um, upstairs? Uh, oh, I forget the name. Anyway, any evening you could stop there at about seven o'clock and there's a half a dozen friends that are sitting around having a drink before they go home. That paid for those couple of waitresses that, that worked there. With the people gone, now there's no business. So when the cruise ship wasn't in, there's no business. So the clubs either folded or moved out to Oaks Field. Once that happened, the city had finally gone to rest. <laughs> right. Now, there's something else. Once they went out to Oaksville or West Bay Street or whatever, this is a whole other talk I'm going to start now. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, there was a, an animal called the cruise director. Cruise director comes in and says, you need 300 people in your club every night. You're charging $24 a head. I'll give you 16, but I'll keep you full. The guy says, oh, that's great. Well, let's, let's sign on the dotted line. 
at least I get to, I don't get as big a spread, but I got a full house and I got sure money. Chick ching, chick ching. Then, every now and then the weather gets bad, the cruise ship doesn't show up, no big deal. I'll reach into my pocket and I'll pay the staff and I'll pay the show. And then it starts getting a little thin. And the cruise director comes in and says, there's a new guy opening up a place and he's offering me $17. Um, um, you know, uh, or offering the show for $14. Can you go down from, from, from 18 to at least 16? You say, well, I gotta keep this business, so yeah, I'll go down. Now, how do you accomplish that? First thing you do is you make sure that your show doesn't cost you as much as it was gonna cost. I want you to cast your mind back to the shows of the, 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 the five or 10 years before the nightclubs disappeared. They were the barest shows you could imagine. They had no special events, no guest artists. Um, they happened very quickly because they had to be finished in time for the cruise visitors to, to leave. In other words, the product deteriorated because the operators couldn't afford to pay for a decent show. If you think back to the, sorry, I do, my wife hates when I do this. If you think back to the days of the Cat and the Fiddle and the Zanzibar, you had the Silver Prince, you had the Plastic Man, you had all these special artists that would come in from Haiti, the Dominican Republic, Cuba, that had to be paid. They were prepared to pay them. And the shows lasted a good long while. So you could sit there and have a drink and enjoy the show. Suddenly, the show was a wham bam, thank you ma'am, 20 minutes long and it's over and everybody leaves. Well, when the ship stopped coming, that was not marketable. Now the operator couldn't make a living. So what did he do? Close down. Catering to short-term visitors has killed 50% of our attractions, not just the nightclubs. They've killed tours as well. <coughs> They've killed tours as well. The cruise industry is not our friend. I'm not saying we should discourage them. I'm not saying we should get rid of them but we should look after our own business. Let me give you some numbers. In 2005, we had 4.86 million visitors. Of the 4.86 million, 3 million were cruise visitors, 64%. That year, the record that the pub, what was published by the Ministry of Tourism was that revenue from the cruise, uh, from, the, from tourism in general was two billion and sixty-eight million dollars. Out of the two billion and sixty-eight million dollars, do you know how much that sixty-four percent contributed? One hundred and seventy-nine million nine hundred thousand. Less than nine percent. Less than nine percent. So what we have done is we have we have made a commitment to a business that gives us less than 10% of our income at the expense of the business that was giving us 90% of our income. That's what we've done. And ain't nobody talking about that because we'd rather talk about the fact that we hit 6.2 million last year. But you'll notice that there was no mention of how many of the 6.2 million were stopover visitors. And there certainly was no mention of income figures. The latest figures that I've been able to find um, online is 2009, five years ago. And I would have thought that if I'm gonna brag about the amount of business I'm having, I should be able to buy, brag about how much money I'm making. Two questions. Yes, sir. Um, more of a little bit of a statement than anything. Um, I feel the pain that we are in downtown business. Um, just to give you two thoughts. If you 
you actually look at the security figures and figures that immigration publishes, mm -hmm. um, immigration cleared 800,000 passengers mm -hmm. in 2012, when the tourism claimed to be 1.2. I don't know if 400,000 <laughs> people that didn't do immigration, which kind of seems kind of odd to me. But, um, also, Finnish Tourism publishes a $61 number as the cruise ship passengers spend mm -hmm. uh, after you take out taxes. It's actually $39. Um, $39 is what Bahamas gets. Mm -hmm. Average Caribbean is $87 per spend. We're missing $50 per person just to be the average of what everybody else gets. Um, so, Did of the 5 million passengers that are here mm -hmm. that we already have, we're mm -hmm. missing 250 million dollars of business that we're not getting just to be average, not even better than average or below average. We are, we are at the worst, uh, like you said, there's nothing to buy, there's nothing yeah. to buy. But part of that experience is when we come off the ship, it is the most harassing situation you could imagine as a passenger, 43% of crucial passengers don't get off the ship. They do not want to go through the harassment. And they say the number one thing is it's nothing to do with NASA. That's correct. Um, so, well, we've taken that a little bit further. Um, got our planning. We have, with our little area, um, with Freightlip on one end and Watkins on the other, we've created a little designated area called um, Star Charlestown, mm -hmm. which is the name of NASA. Um, and we're getting a designation from the government as a historical district. You'll see some of the work that we've already done. The art gallery is doing a lot of work as well. Um, we're actually going to be adding in the next probably two to three months, you'll see. Um, we're adding in a museum on the history of Bahamas. There's no museum here. There's nothing to tell you who we are. We're adding in also a microbrewery. Yes, we paint beer here, but you got to go buy it in the liquor store. You can't go and buy it and drink it right there. I mean, it's made right there. It'll be made in front of you. So we're adding that. We're bringing Androsia from Andros. We're going to bring Androsia. We're going to have Androsia manufactured on Western Street. Um, so another destination. Um, we're also converting the old convent, the dormitory, the building, and whatever other areas there, into a marketplace for Bahamian-made goods. So you'll be able to buy something Bahamian at the straw market. It's a beautiful building that you designed, but ain't nothing Bahamian in there. <laughs> nothing Bahamian in there. And that's what we're missing. I tell you, I have hundreds of people who come to see me, and I meet them there, and they go, I want to buy some Bahamian, and I go, well, uh, sell your cigar that's made here, I can sell your chocolate that's made here. But if, you know, there's a few other things. There's rum that's made across the street, you know, I can sell your beer. But if you want straw, you gotta go to Red Bay. Oops. You gotta go to Long Island. You gotta go to this. You know, there's nothing here. There's nothing Bahamian. And that's what we're missing. We're missing the Bahamian part of the Bahamas. And that's what we're trying to create there. That whole district, we're going to be pedestrianizing. What's happening downtown is majority can make up their mind what the hell they want to do. Move the shipping, do this, do that. Entrepreneurial leadership, son. There's nothing there. We've, our association is all about entrepreneurial spirit and it's all run by entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And it's not a bureaucracy. We're not in it to make money for the association or whatever it is. We're all there to sell a game product. Mm -hmm. and bring tourist dollars to our area. And what we're missing is the Indian product. That's mm -hmm. my statement. I think, uh, I think uh, Great Drift should be congratulated for spearheading that effort. Yeah. And he's absolutely right, apart from the Great Cliff experience and the, um, uh, the Art Gallery, National Art Gallery, you have um, the uh, John Canoe, experience next door um, there's uh, there's a, a little uh, bed and breakfast that has a bush garden 
that's doing a wonderful little job around on Delancey Street as well. Um, it's called Delancey Town. Yeah. Um, so it's a wonderful area that's developing, but it's again, it's you know, it's we're scratching the surface. We're just we're just beginning. What we need is we need more and more and more and more and more. You have one last question. Certainly. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it's interesting you should, you should say it that way. Um, it's a very important point that if I gave the impression that what I'm looking for is something for tourists, um, then I apologize. Here is what I hoped to give an impression of. My story, my story is interesting. I will tell my story and I will make money telling my story. Now, I didn't say I would tell it to tourists. I didn't say I would tell it to locals. I would tell my story and I will make money. If you think about it, all those places you say, um, started as local. Um, they started as local in only one sense. The patrons for the jazz clubs in New Orleans were first of all people from New Orleans. But you'd be, I think you'd be quite wrong to suggest that when New Orleans decided to create a historic zone uh, around Bourbon Street that it was done for New Orleans. Even though New Orleans, people from New Orleans frequent the place, it was done as a device to make money from the historical aspect of uh, Bourbon Street and its surrounds. Um, if you're telling your story, you participate in it. That's, that's the biggest thing I can say. You know, I, if, if we have theater, it's not going to be theater for somebody else. It's going to be theater for me, and somebody else is going to be able to enjoy it. So 
but uh, I think it's very important that you said what you said because uh, it would be a tragedy if we set out to create a place where, as we have done, we draw a line and we say tourists are over there and locals are over there. I, I, I keep hearing something that I don't get angry too often. But when I hear somebody say, well, you know, we can't invite people over the hill because it ain't safe. I really get upset. I really, it's a fabrication. It's something we've created. I, I go to New York and when, in the 60s when I went down to Harlem, there were more people being mugged in Harlem than there are being mugged in the Bahamas. But it didn't stop anybody from going. That's where the best clubs were. And people went in droves. Right? They made movies about them. But this, we've, we've gotten this sanitized idea about what we do with a tourist. A tourist is simply you somewhere else. That's all. That's all. It's not like they're a different species of human beings. <laughs> they're just you somewhere else. They come to town, they want to find out who you are. They want to find out who, they want to find out how do you get married? Anybody ever notice that the logo for the city of New Orleans is? Anybody? It's a man dancing, a silhouette of a man dancing. Do you know what that dance is he's doing? It's called a two-step. Do you know when they do a two-step? Those of you who are old enough remember that once upon a time we used to go to the graveyard Da 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 da. But when it was time to come back, da 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 da. Understand? They do the same thing. They dance on the way back from the graveyard, and the two-step is what they do. And so culturally, that's that's theirs, and they've adopted it as their logo. That's how they make their history and their culture a part of what they offer as product in their business. That's all. We need to understand that we are the most interesting people in the world. Um, again, I'm going to ask you forgiveness, because when I do this, people think I'm going off my rocker. 350,000 people in this country there is no country anywhere that you could name that have produced the number of exceptional people as the Bahamas. None. We are the most interesting people in the world. My son wrote an essay he called Santa Ana. He said, if you heard of a place where, uh, where they had a population of 350,000 called Santa Ana in Texas, uh, and they said, that they had had uh, Academy Award winners, they had had world champion boxers and wrestlers and uh, Olympic gold medalists, and you'd ask, what's in the water in that place? <laughs> Seriously, think of the large cities in the US that can record two basketball players that made it to the, N to the NBA. We don't even notice how many of our basketball players make it to the NBA. In 2000, we had four women, four women in the top 10 fastest women in the world. No other country has ever done that. Not even the US, right? Four women in the top 10 fast. We don't even notice. This is the most interesting and most accomplished country in the world. We're the only people who don't know that. <laughs> we have more to sell in terms of our, the experience of ourselves and telling people who we are than anybody in the world. And what do we do? Like I said, we put it in the warehouse, close the door, and lock it. There you go.
What kind of what kind of warehouse we got? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it uh, that exemplifies. This is one of my Bahamian heroes. This gentleman here in Jackson Burnside, and I've been blown away. Thank you, not only with your singing, dancing, but with your presentation. But. I don't want to take George Borlandelli's thunder to give the official vote of thanks. Thanks very much, Mr. Ramming. Uh, I've been with the Nassau Institute for, I think, six years now, Rick? Yes. Uh, I've been six years with the Nassau Institute, and this has been the best speech I've heard, including all the foreign uh, uh, guests and uh, it's it reminds me how a shame it is that uh, that old saying that nobody is a prophet in his own land uh, I would like to thank you on behalf of the Nassau Institute and I'm sure of all the audience and uh, present you with these two books as a token of our appreciation thank you very much thanks to you